Amen. Turn to Revelation 21, please. We stopped at 21 verse 1. We got, uh, we talked about the um, second coming of Christ. We saw that in chapter 19 when Jesus returns riding on the white horse. Uh, the world is in the battle of Armageddon. It's on the brink of annihilation. And we come back with Jesus riding on white horses and he will uh, conquer the enemy. He will uh, have the Antichrist and the false prophet thrown into the lake of fire forever and ever it burns. And then he has Satan locked away for a thousand years. And we saw over and over again, six times it tells us it's a 1,000 year period. Uh, we looked at the Old Testament scriptures. There's many, many of them that speak of the millennial reign of Christ, the thousand year reign of Christ. He's going to take this world that was devastated during the Great Tribulation. He'll make it like the Garden of Eden once again. It's going to be beautiful. It's going to be gorgeous. It's going to be life. Um, it's just going to be an amazing time. He's going to rule and reign for a thousand years as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And the whole time, Satan, one of the reasons it's so good is because Satan is locked in the bottomless pit for 1,000 years. And so we'll be with the Lord, ruling and reigning with him. He'll be ruling with a rod of iron because there's people that make it through the Great Tribulation that go into the millennial reign of Christ in their natural bodies, and they will repopulate the earth. And so the reason it says Jesus is ruling and reigning with a rod of iron is because they are not born again at this point. They uh, will still choose to do things wrong. Um, a rod of iron simply means Jesus will keep them under control, so to speak. And, and part of it is he will not tolerate anarchy, uh, which is where people do what's right in their own eyes. He will not tolerate that during the thousand-year reign of Christ. We know many people will not trust the Lord during the millennium. How do we know that? Because we saw last time in chapter 20, verse 7, that after the thousand years, Satan is released from the abyss, the bottomless pit, and he very, it says very short time he has, micros chronos, a very small amount of time, he deceives many people, millions and millions of people on earth to come against the Lord there in Jerusalem. And all we're told, one verse, it says God just sends fire down and consumes them, and that's it. No big battle. The Lord ends it. Well, then we saw that after that takes place, he is going to literally vaporize the entire universe. Um, he's going to melt with fervent heat. Read 2 Peter 3, verses 10 to 13. All the elements, it says, in the universe are going to melt. It's going to pass away with a great noise. It'll be like one giant nuclear explosion throughout the universe. It's all going to be consumed. And then it tells us, there, I guess, in the middle of nothingness, the great white throne and all those who rejected God and his word and his provision for salvation will stand at the great white throne at sentencing day for the lake of fire. And immediately after that's done, chapter 21, verse 1 tells us, as we saw last week, John says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. So a new heaven, a new earth. Don't think of a new heaven as in God's dwelling place. There's three heavens. Paul says he was caught up into the third heaven. That's the place of God's dwelling. But the first heaven is our atmosphere. The second heaven is the universe. And that's what's going to be vaporized. And then he creates a whole new universe, a whole new planet earth. And he says there'll be no more sea during that time. And so now we enter into the things of eternity after the thousand-year reign of Christ, and it's going to be glorious from here on out, the things that we're going to see and witness. Verse 2 says, then I, then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And so here we're introduced to the holy city of God, New Jerusalem. It's a holy city. And again, I challenge you to go to any major city in the world today. You're not going to find a holy city. You're going to find a lot of crime, a lot of violence, a lot of theft, a lot of problems. But when Jesus brings down the holy city of New Jerusalem, it is going to be glorious. It's going to be God's home. It's where we're going to live with the Lord forever and ever. 
Notice it says here that um, God has prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. God has prepared this place. Jesus tells us about this place in John chapter 14, verse 1. He says, let not your hearts be troubled. Do you believe in God? Believe also in me. And then verse 2 says, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So God has been preparing this place, or Jesus has been preparing this place for the last 2,000 years. And now it's prepared, it's finished, and we'll see that here in a moment. Notice how John describes this city. Uh, it's prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. In other words, like the bride of Christ that dwells in this city will be gorgeous in the eyes of the Lord. This holy city is going to be beautiful as well. That phrase, adorned for her husband, is the greatest compliment you can give a woman as she's getting married. She's at the peak of her beauty. It's hard for me as a guy to think of that as the bride of Christ that we are, that the Lord sees us in the peak of our beauty. When I look in the mirror, I'm like, yeah, not yet, but the day is coming when the Lord <laughs> will say that over his bride. But he sees us that way because we are in Christ. Now, I've done many, many weddings over the years, and I've never seen an ugly bride. And I mean that. You know, after the fact, I don't know, you know. <laughs> but at the way, but during, I'm being facetious. Don't write any letters. Um, but, you know, it's almost like God gives that bride a supernatural makeover because, I mean, literally every time I'll be up here or wherever we're doing the wedding, the, you know, the groomsman standing here next to me and, and I watch and he turns and watches his bride is coming down the aisle and man, his face is just glowing, and he realizes I'm getting the better end of this deal. I mean, it's obvious, and we, all of us as husbands probably think, yeah, I got the better end of this deal. But it, it's just amazing. They, it's almost like the, the wife-to-be is glowing at that moment as she's walking towards her husband-to-be, and uh, it's just an amazing thing. But as husbands, especially those of us who've been married for a while, I think we need to be reminded from time to time, and I'm reminded all the time, I got the better end of this deal. You know, Elizabeth's got to put up with all my quirks and idiosyncrasies, but she is such a blessing. Now, I think this whole scene in Revelation, it's a beautiful picture of Ephesians 5. We'll go through some verses here in Ephesians 5 where Paul writes, Husbands, this is Ephesians 5.25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. So how much did he love us? He gave himself, his very life for us. Just as means exactly as Jesus loves the church. That's how we're to love our wives. And every time I read that, I'm like, uh -uh, I can't. That's why the Lord says, I know. Apart from me, you can do nothing. But we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit and then we can have that same agape love for our spouse, even as Jesus has for us. He says he gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. So when I go through the scriptures, you know, we as believers are thoroughly cleansed and washed. You know, we just talked about it during communion. We've been cleansed, washed clean by the blood of the Lamb, Jesus. His blood is a powerful cleansing agent, the, the most powerful. He's washed away all of our sins. The Holy Spirit, powerful cleansing agent, is the rivers of living water pour into our lives, flow out of our lives, but also never take the Word of God for granted. The Word of God cleanses us. The Word of God washes us clean, as it says here, that we might be cleansed with the washing of water by the Word. King David wrote in Psalm 119, Verses 9 and 11, how can a young man cleanse his way by taking heed according to your word? And then he says, your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin 
against you. This is why we spend so much time in the Word of God, and this is why I exhort people all the time. Be in the Word. Don't substitute anything for the Word of God. This will cleanse your heart. This will direct your path. The Word of God is God's Word to us that describes who God is, His nature, His character, everything He is, and what we are in Christ, and, and what He's got in store for us. I mean, everything for life and godliness is found here in the Word of God. Anyway, Paul goes on to say in Ephesians 5.27 that he, speaking of Jesus, might present her to himself a glorious church, notice, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she, speaking of us, should be holy and without blemish. Again, that's how the Lord sees us. That's the picture we're seeing here in Revelation 21 2. The holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, adorned as a bride for her husband. Now, the marriage between Jesus and his church takes place right after the rapture. We are brought into his presence. We uh, go through the refiner's fire. We're given linen, fine and clean. Those are wedding garments. It's not robes that he gives us. We're already clothed with robes of righteousness now, but then we're given wedding garments. We'll be married because now, Paul says, we're betrothed to the Lord Jesus Christ, but then we will be married to him. We have the marriage supper of the Lamb. I think it lasts through the millennial reign of Christ, and we're going to be in this intimate relationship with Christ forever and ever. What an amazing time this will be. As the spouse of the bride, we're going to continually grow. We're going to continually get to know him better. I mean, he's God. He's infinite. We're finite creatures. We will know him when we see him face to face, even as we're known. But we're never going to be bored. We're never going to get tired. We're never going to wonder, is this the right spouse to be married to? That won't even enter our thoughts. We'll be in the presence of Jesus forever and ever. There will never be fights. There will never be arguments with our groom. Um, I do a thousand and one stupid things that can lead to all kinds of stupid arguments. But when we're in the presence of the Lord, it's going to be a honeymoon type of relationship that will last throughout eternity. Now, when Jesus writes the letter to the church of Ephesus, he commends them on all the good things they were doing. They were able to spot false teachers and false apostles, and you know they were standing strong in the word. But he says, I have this one thing against you. Remember that? It's in Revelation 2, verse 4. He says, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. And as we saw, our first love refers to that moment we first got saved. It refers to that moment when Jesus came into our lives and now he's our Lord, he's our Savior, he's our best friend. He's radically saved me and washed my sins away and he has changed me. And do you remember? Do you remember? Do you remember that moment when you became a new creation in Christ? Do you remember that moment when all the heavy burdens of sin that you've been carrying around in your life were let go and removed, washed away once and for all. When you think of these things and, and who he is and what he's done for us, we need to just stay in that love relationship with him. In those early days of our salvation, I know for me, I couldn't wait to get home. I was a junior in, in San Diego State. I get saved. And Jesus just consumed everything. I couldn't wait to get home, just open up my Bible and just start underlining everything the Lord was showing me. And then I still got that Bible in my office. It's all ripped to shreds and hanging on by a thread. But I mean, do you remember what it was like when you first got saved and you realized, you discovered all the new things about God's grace for you, his compassion towards you, where we realized that God loved us so much that he sent Jesus to die on the cross, shed his blood for our sins, that he would actually adopt us into his family. So he chose us. You know, we're you know, stuck with our relatives. We choose our friends. But God chose us into his family. He adopted us because he loves us. 
We should always be growing in that relationship with Christ. We always should have that desire to be in the Word. Don't ever let this become old news to you. Old Testament, New Testament is God's living Word. Be consumed by it. Let the Word of God fill you up overflowing so you can rely on what God has for you. You can trust what He says is true. Don't be like the Israelites in the wilderness. Remember when they were wandering and they get out there and they start grumbling and complaining. You know, we don't have anything to eat. So God sends them manna. So they collect the manna. And then he sent them the next day, what? More manna. The next day, more manna. Forty years of manna. Moses had written all the recipes about manna. But manna bread... Manicotti, come up with your own. That's all I know. But what are they doing? They're grumbling and complaining. God, all we're getting is this manna. We're so tired of this manna. And so God says, all right. He gives them quail. He says, quail came into the camp three feet high. People are just grabbing them. They're just ripping them apart. They're eating them before they even cook them. They said many people got sick and died because that's what their flesh wanted. Manna was what they needed. It was God's superfood. It was God's food that sustained them for 40 years. Jesus says, I am the manna that came down from heaven. Moses didn't say, you know, give you that manna. I'm the manna that came down. I'm the bread of life. And so when you start grumbling and complaining about God's word, oh, I've read through it, now it's boring, you're doing the same thing that the Israelites did with the manna. And then people start saying, oh, man, i got to find other stuff. Well, we got a bookstore of other stuff. And, and it's good because the books that we carry will point you back to the word of God and Jesus Christ. But there's so many things that try to become a substitute for the word of God. Be careful. This has always got to be first and foremost in your heart, in our lives. This relationship between a husband and wife is really a reflection, should be, of our relationship with our groom-to-be Jesus and us, his betrothed, because it's a glorious reflection. He's the groom, we're his bride, and we are to have a relationship with him that is intimate, that is oneness, where the two become one flesh. That's what happens in a marriage, where all that she has is his, all that he has is hers. I mean, that's just the oneness that we should have as husband and wife. That's the oneness that can only happen when a husband and wife are putting their needs secondary. They're putting their spouse's needs above their own needs. This reflection of Jesus and his bride and how it manifests itself in our own marriages is one uh, is, the, is the number one reason why Satan is attacking marriages constantly. He hates marriages because it does represent that relationship between a husband and a wife, between God and us, between Jesus and his bride. It was God who established marriage. He established it in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 2.24. Jesus reiterates the exact same thing when he talks about marriage in Matthew 19. The Apostle Paul, going back to Ephesians 5, says the exact same thing. Ephesians 5.31. They all say this, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. The word means to cleave, to be super glued together, and the two shall become one flesh. That is a godly marriage. God wrote the rules. If you have any you know, opinions of your own, take it up with God. I don't need to hear it because God wrote the rules. One man, one woman equals a marriage in God's sight. Marriage is much more than the arrangement of two people living together or sleeping together. Marriage in God's eyes is a supernatural joining together of a man and a woman that share two lives, two hearts, who are supposed to love each other unconditionally, again, even as Jesus loves you. Paul says it like this in Ephesians 5.28, so husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, 
just as the Lord does the church. I'm sure glad that Jesus loves me like that, where he is nourishing and cherishing me as his bride-to-be, and we should be nourishing and cherishing our spouses. Guys, that is how we are to be with our wives. Do you cherish your wife? Do you spend time encouraging her, building her up? I fall short constantly. We all do, but come back to the Lord. Come back to His Word. Let the Holy Spirit fill you with that love for your spouse once again. Don't let your grumbling heart start complaining. Oh, I wish she was this way. I wish she was that way. What I've seen in my own marriage and in many other marriages that are on the rocks, it's both partners, both husband and wife aren't doing what God calls us to do. Husbands, love your wife just as Christ loves the church. Wife, submit to your own husband as to the Lord. Pretty simple. Pretty clear. Don't start saying, well, I'll start loving her once she submits to me, or I'll submit to that idiot once he starts loving me. It's not going to work. But if you love her, as she described here in verse 2, as a bride adorned for her husband, and you see her that way, God can really change the direction of your marriage. Now, there's one more thing in this verse. This is why we're not getting very far in this message today. Note, New Jerusalem, it's a holy city. We'll see it's a city where many, many people, probably billions of people are going to live in this city. You think New York is crowded? You think Shanghai with their 20 million or Delhi with their 22 million is crowded? This is going to have billions of people in New Jerusalem. But it's a massive city. It's about 12 or 1,500 miles in each direction, like a giant cube. And we're not living on the surface of it. We're all living inside it. And when we get to the dimensions and all that's going to be in there, there's going to be room for everyone. It's not going to be crowded, even with billions of people. This is going to be the perfect community for all of God's people. And this is the place that you know Abraham longed for. This is what Abraham, or we're told what Abraham longed for in Hebrews 10, 11, verse 10. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. This is the place that Jesus has been preparing for the last 2,000 years. Um, in speaking of the many Old Testament saints in Hebrews eleven sixteen, it says, But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And again, that's what we'll be looking at over the next whatever weeks in these chapters. Look at verse 3. This just keeps building. It gets better and better. Verse 3 says, And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. We don't know who this loud voice is, but this is one of the most amazing verses, I think, in the Bible, that this verse states the essence of God's eternal desire is to dwell among his people, is to be in fellowship with his created people. God's plan from the very beginning was to live in close fellowship with mankind. Notice these words in verse 3, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them. Tabernacle and dwell comes from the same Greek root word. It means to abide. It means to live among, to reside with. The entire city of New Jerusalem is God's tabernacle, his dwelling place. Now, remember when Moses built the tabernacle that God instructed him to build? It was a model uh, of New Jerusalem. The Holy of Holies is like New Jerusalem. That was 15 cubits in each direction, the Holy of Holies. This is like 1,500 miles in every direction. But it was the Holy of Holies because when they dedicated the tabernacle, the Shekinah glory of God came down and it represented his dwelling among the people there in the wilderness. And then later on when they brought it into the promised land. Then Solomon builds the temple. Same thing. They dedicate the temple. God's Shekinah glory comes down and God dwells among his people. But over time, because of the continued sin 
In rebellion of the Israelites, God's glory left. Ichabod, <laughs> the glory has departed. And Israel, because of their continued sin and rebellion against God, God decided to leave. Now, even before Moses built the tabernacle and Solomon built the temple, God tabernacled among his first two people that he created, Adam and Eve. It's not on the screen, but in Genesis 3, 8, it says God came in the cool of the evening just to hang out with them. God just wanted to be in fellowship with his creatures. And then it's like they're hiding because of their sin. Adam, where are you? God knew where he was. He was just trying to bring him out. What have you done? It's that woman you gave me. What did the woman say? It's that serpent. Everybody's passing the buck. But again, dwelling among his people has always been God's desire. But mankind always ruins it because of sin. But that's exactly why Jesus came 2,000 years ago to reestablish that relationship between us and our Creator. Um, again, He died in our place so that our sins could be forgiven. He shed His blood so our sins could be washed away. Remembers them no more. He casts them as far as the east is from the west. In John 1.1 1, 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. And then in John 1.14 it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt or tabernacled among us, and we beheld His glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The word dwelt, again, the same word used here. He has dwelt among us and we will dwell in His presence. Jesus came into this world, the Son of God, God the Son. He lived, He resided, He dwelt among His people. And again, it was for the purpose of reuniting us to the Father. Now here's an awesome truth. God no longer dwells in man-made tabernacles or buildings. God doesn't dwell inside this building because it's a church. Where does God dwell today? in our hearts, in our lives, in our bodies. This is what Paul says to the carnal Christians in Corinth, 1 Corinthians 6.18, Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price, again, the blood of Jesus. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's or which belongs to God. So glorify God in your body. Even though this is flesh, it's just going to keel over one day. As long as we're in these bodies, glorify the Lord. He's in our spirit. That's what's going to dwell with him forever and ever. Glorify the Lord in your spirit, in your body, everything you do. And even with the Lord dwelling inside of us, we have not even come close to realizing or understanding the awesome fellowship that God desires to have with you and me. I can't. Maybe you can, but I can't. My little BB brain cannot comprehend. Being in His presence, seeing Him face to face, I can only imagine. Mercy me. <laughs> I can only imagine what it's going to be like. But one day soon, God himself will dwell and tabernacle with us and we will be with him and we will behold him in all of his majesty and glory and beauty. And that is what will make heaven so awesome, so amazing. We will be in the very presence of God for eternity. And so whatever your circumstances are today, whatever bad things you might be going through today, never lose hope. Don't let those things drag you down. I know it's hard to see because there's so much garbage in this world, but let the Lord be in the midst of all that you go through and He will give you peace that surpasses all understanding. He will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Keep your eyes on the Lord. Uh, Colossians 3 one says, Set your mind on things above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of the Lord. Jesus is the one who says he'll never leave us nor forsake us. And look at this verse in 1 Corinthians 13, 12. For now, presently, right now, in these bodies, we see in a mirror dimly. 
But then, face to face, now I know in part. I certainly don't know everything uh, about God and his glory and majesty. But then I shall know just as I also am known. Isn't that going to be awesome? When we see the Lord and we're going to know him fully, and even though now what he's revealed to us in his word is amazing and glorious and wonderful, we're just scratching the surface. It's like the tip of the iceberg for what he's prepared for all of us when we see him face to face. Paul says it like this in 1 Corinthians, I think it's in chapter 3, Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither is... Uh, neither has it entered the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for those who love him. But then he says, even though by now the Holy Spirit has revealed some of these things to us, but we just don't fully comprehend. Well, look at verse 4. I love this verse as well. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. You know, a little later on in this vision, John will tell us about all the things that we're going to see in heaven, all the things that are going to be there in New Jerusalem. But here he gives us a little taste of what's not going to be there. And I like that. What's not going to be there? Death. In other words, I'm not going to be doing any funerals in heaven. You know, I've done a lot of funerals here and now, and it brings sorrow. There's not going to be any more sorrow. You know, we don't sorrow as those who have no hope, Paul says. Funerals are tough. But a day is coming, no more funerals, no more burials, no more cremations. You know, we mourn, we grieve when a loved one goes home to be with the Lord. They're not mourning and grieving. They're up there going, wow, this is awesome. I can't believe it. This is glorious. And we're like, oh, man, I miss them. Yeah, we do. But there'll be no more pain, it says here. No, nor, no, uh, nor sorrow, nor crying. I mean, we cry over all kinds of stuff now, but no more crying. No more pain. Now, again, think of all the pain that you go through. And I know a lot of you have different body parts than what you were born with. And it was painful. New knee, new hip. Some of us need a new brain. They haven't done that yet. But, I mean, we're falling apart. There's a lot of pain, but a day is coming where he says he will wipe every tear from our eyes. Every tear we've ever shed. I mean, it'll be done once and for all. I mean, can you just picture, it says God. So the Father, we're there, and he'll, he will wipe away the tear from our eyes. It's hard to imagine. That'll be the last tear you ever shed. Over what? I don't know. It'll be different for all of us. He's going to wipe away every tear. Now, what a contrast to all the people who have rejected God's free gift of salvation. To those who have rejected Christ and his sacrifice for sin, what awaits them is weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, just the opposite of what we will not experience. For eternity, Jesus says, in the lake of fire, but for all of God's people, all the pain and suffering, all the sorrow that we've experienced in this life will be gone forever. You know, there's an old saying, it's very true. For those who know Jesus, hopefully all of us in here, this today is as close as we will ever get to hell. But for those who do not know Jesus and reject him when they die, they reject him till they die. This is as close to heaven as they will ever get. And it's true. Keep your eyes on the Lord. Look at verse 5. Then he who sat on the throne said, So who's this speaking? Well, we already saw Jesus and the Father sit on the same throne. So this is the Father and the Son, or the Father, or the, I don't know. Well, let's, let's go with Jesus. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, he tells John, write, for these words are true and faithful. Again, another amazing verse. God has just revealed that the former things have passed away. Now he says, behold, I make all things new. And this is certainly one of the 
glorious truths that the Lord makes all things new. In fact, not only will Jesus make all things new here in Revelation, but he's making all things new in your life today if you know him as your Lord and Savior. He's replaced all the old nasty stuff. And if there's something you're hanging on to, give it to the Lord. Surrender it to the Lord. And he will replace it with something much, much better. Oh, I can't give this up, Lord. Yeah, you give it up. And he'll replace it with something more glorious. Jesus will not only create a new heaven and a new earth, but he has created a brand new you if you've received him as your Lord and Savior. The Apostle Paul, speaking of this glorious transformation that the Lord is doing within us today, says this, 2 Corinthians 4.16, Therefore, we do not lose heart. So you might be struggling with something right now, but don't lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. So we're in this sanctification process. Never forget, the moment Christ came into your life, you were justified. God sees you, a uh, simple way to explain justification, just as if you'd never sinned. He has justified you, declared you righteous. That's how he sees you right now, because you're in Christ. But it also says we're in the sanctification process. In other words, we're going from glory to glory, 2 Corinthians 3.18. Ultimately, because the last time I looked in the mirror, it hasn't happened yet, will come glorification. And that's when we'll be in our resurrection bodies and we'll be in His presence and it's going to be amazing. So even though the outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Wow. I mean, again, think of all the old stuff that Jesus has already gotten rid out of our lives. Hopelessness, despair, sin that separated us from God, unrighteousness, rebellion, He's removed guilt and shame from us. And I always like to put a qualification here. If you've let him, some of you aren't letting him remove the guilt and shame from your past. Satan will use that to speak words of condemnation. There is no, no condemnation in Christ, but Satan will try to render you inactive or ineffective for the kingdom by saying, you did this, you horrible person. Yeah, you might be saved by Jesus, but he'll never use somebody like you. And if you listen to that and you're holding on to the guilt and shame for your past, Satan, in a sense, has set you on the shelf. Get rid of it. Lay it at the foot of the cross. Jesus has died for all of those things. He's removed the wrath, the condemnation that was hanging over our lives. But then once you get to that point of just releasing all this past to the Lord, then think of the new stuff he has placed within your life, like the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Think of the, the new life, the eternal life he's given us. He's blessed us with riches of grace, it says, riches of mercy. He's given us unconditional love. He's adopted us into his forever family. So I like that adoption. God chose us to be in his family. That's what adoption is. He wanted us. There's a lot of kids born in this world. Their parents don't want them. But praise the Lord, there are adoptive parents that really want that child and they'll adopt them. Well, to a much greater degree, we were born into this world and we had, you know, I had parents that didn't know the Lord. My mom got saved when she was about 71. I was able to lead her to the Lord. But for years and years, they just drank, they just smoked, they were just fighting, they were passed out, my mom, every night. And I'm like, why am I even here? They had me, but it was just sad. And yet, when you get adopted by God, he goes, I want you, Jeff, in my family. And it just blows my mind. He's given us the blessed hope of seeing him in heaven. And I have that hope of seeing Jesus and my mom in heaven now. But that's why the Lord says here, Behold, I make all things new. And that new life we have in Christ 
Hopefully that's enough to motivate you to want to share the good news of Jesus with others. Let them know, hey, if he could save a wretch like me, he can save anybody. He loves you. How do I know? Because he died on the cross for you. He shed his blood for your sins. You got to surrender, repent, turn to Christ, and he will forgive you. Another interesting thing here at the end of verse 5, it says, the Lord tells John, write, for these words are true and faithful. Again, put yourself in John's sandals for a minute. You're up there, you're looking at New Jerusalem. There's God in the midst of it all. Everything's new. And he's just blown away. So it's like Jesus standing next to him. Okay, write this down. Don't forget, all you know, we'll write these things down because what I'm telling you, these words are true. These words are faithful. I mean, John was probably so overwhelmed by what he's seeing and witnessing. He's just awestruck. So the Lord says, write it down. This is absolute truth. Not because I'm teaching the Bible here. No, this is absolute truth because God's word declares these things are true. God has proven himself that he is faithful. He will never leave us nor forsake us forsake us and it's all going to be gone all the junk forever and ever he's going to make all things new that is his promise one thing about heaven nothing's ever going to wear out nothing's ever going to rust out nothing's ever going to break he makes it all new and look at verse six and he said to me it is done i am the alpha and the omega the beginning and the end we saw in chapter one that's a title for God. That's also a title for Jesus because Jesus is God the Son. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. So it is done. Remember what Jesus cried out on the cross? It is finished. The work was finished for our salvation. The work for sin was taken care of where he shed his blood so that our sins could be washed away. But this cry is a little different when he says, it is done. It's like, the, it's like a cry of a carpenter who is finished preparing a place for us. New Jerusalem. It is done. The work is completed. The job is finished. I can hardly wait to see it. I hope you're ready. Again, Jesus always finishes what he starts. He, that's what it means, the Alpha and the Omega, first and last, beginning and the end. And that not only applies to building, creating, preparing New Jerusalem, it also includes you and me. He will finish what he started. One of my favorite verses, Philippians 1.6. I hope you have this confidence because he tells us, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work, in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 12, 2 reminds us Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. It's done. Why? Because God says it's done. In his day, at that time, we'll see the finished product. But even this late in the, the game here, so to speak, with all that's gone on, the great tribulations take place, Millennial reign. He's talking about new heavens and new earth. He also mentions here, I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. Even now, he's extending an invitation to you. If you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you need to come to him by faith. Nothing in this world will ever satisfy your thirsty heart, your thirsty soul. All the money in the world won't buy you happiness. All the relationships you could have. You can have a thousand people, best friends on Facebook. That's not going to satisfy. It doesn't matter. Nothing in this world, no religion will satisfy. Every religion will leave you empty. Riches, again, will leave you thirsty for more. Only one person can satisfy your empty heart, and that's Jesus Christ. Jesus says in John 7, 37, yeah, on the last day, the great day of the feast, the Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. 
Again, it's all or nothing with the Lord. You either drink of the living water of Christ and experience eternal life, or you kind of slap the cup out of his hand and say, I'll do my own thing. I'll live my own life. And you will perish in your sinful, dried up, thirsty condition. Don't forget this verse, 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack or slow concerning his promise, as some count slackness or slowness, but is long-suffering. That means God is patient toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He doesn't desire for any of us to die and be cast into the lake of fire. How do we know? He demonstrated his own love toward us, and while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He loves you. Don't wait. Verse 7, He who overcomes shall inherit all things. Again, I can't comprehend what that means. Remember in uh, chapters 2 and 3, Jesus' seven letters to the seven churches, He gives them a promise at the end of each letter to Him who overcomes. And then He's got this beautiful blessing for those who overcome. And here He just summarizes it by saying, He who overcomes shall inherit all things. Not just those seven things, but all things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. That's the ultimate inheritance. He's our father. We're his children. We will dwell with him forever and ever. But we shall inherit all things. Some of you may have heard of, studied the great Chicago fire. It happened in 1871. I mean, it killed thousands, destroyed thousands of homes and buildings. It leveled you know, blocks, miles and miles. I mean, it was brutal. D.L. Moody, the famous evangelist of the time, his house burnt to the ground, just a pile of ashes. And he stood there on the sidewalk looking at his pile of ashes there. And somebody came up to him and said, Oh, Mr. Moody, we're so sorry you lost everything. And he says, I didn't lose anything. He says, what do you mean you didn't lose anything? You mean you, you, your house is a pile of ashes here. So it says, Moody had his Bible with him. He opens it up to Revelation 21, verse 7. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. He says, I've lost nothing. What a great attitude. That's how we should live. You know, have a light hold in the things of this world. Have a firm grip on the things of eternity. What a great view of life. Jesus is all we need. Let me close with this last verse, verse 8. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now it's being cowardly and unbelieving that will keep a person out of heaven. It's not these other things listed here that's going to keep anybody out of heaven. How do we know that? Because many of us have been on this list of things that keep us away from God. And if we don't turn to Christ, if we don't repent of our sins, we will be lost forever. But how do we know? Because we were forgiven. There's only one sin that will keep anybody out of you know, eternal life in the presence of God that one sin is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. What is that? It's when you reject the convicting work of the Holy Spirit who's pointing you to Jesus, saying He's the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through Him, and you die without Jesus. You've committed blasphemy of the Holy Spirit because you said, I don't need Jesus. I don't need that conviction. I'm going to do my own thing. You die without Jesus. That's the only sin that will keep you out of heaven. Unbelieving. Now, we can stop being unbelieving. We can turn to Christ, receive Him by faith, and it doesn't matter what you've done, it doesn't matter how many sins you've committed, God is ready, willing, and able to forgive you. How do we know this? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, starting in verse 9, look at these verses. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? An unrighteous person means... You rejected God, you rejected His Word, you rejected the salvation Jesus is offering. Do not be deceived, neither 
fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. You look at that, and I look at that and say, yeah, I'm on that list. Oh, no, I'm doomed. No, you're not, because verse 11, and such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Paul says, all right, this is who you were, but those sins don't keep you out of heaven. It's your unbelief. It's your failure to turn to Christ, to repent of your sins, and receive him as your Lord and Savior. That will keep you out of heaven. Again, Jesus paid the price in full, no matter what we've done. I mean, he mentions murderers. Uh, a lady came up to me after you know this, and you said, well, probably nobody in here was a murderer, but she says, I was. I had two abortions. But... She started smiling, but I've been forgiven. Jesus came into my life and saved me. He took away the guilt and shame. I mean, it's awesome what God can do when we surrender to him. To me, this should be a no-brainer. If you come to Christ, you will inherit all things. God will take you into his home. He will adopt you. You'll have never-ending, everlasting life. Or you can reject him. You can say, I don't want God. I don't want Jesus. I don't want to hear the gospel anymore. And you'll find yourself in the lake of fire, he says. Choose wisely. Mm -hmm.